Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. And let's start off um, in Gaza. As we know, uh, President Joe Biden, he has um, signed documents in, and that places some sanctions against Israel for what is going on in Gaza um, that... It has gotten to the point that civilians stopped a truck from entering Gaza uh, that had hum- humanitarian goods. Um, that they attacked it, uh, mass people attacked in a mob, attacked the truck, and stopped the truck from from crossing in to to Gaza to and at the same time it was reported w- um, in the past few days that at least three children died of starvation many people in Gaza are are suffering from starvation and are dying from the lack of food clean water and medical supplies these people are non-combatants and should be treated as the civilians that they are and given the medical treatment, the food, and the shelter and safe haven away from the fighting that they deserve. And that's part of what um, President Biden is talking about in this, these documents that, um, that he has released is placing sanctions against Israel for for um, what is going on with humanitarian efforts. Now, okay, let's give take a couple steps back when we consider uh, the UNRWA situation, where um, UNRWA workers were actually part of the kidnappers. We do have to question how these humanitarian supplies could be distributed and are they being distributed to civilians or could they be distributed to uh, militants so and how to and how is that truly distinguished so there's there's it's not a black and white situation it is a a all over gray situation that you have to take slow steps into how we, how are we going to fix the violence in the Middle East because it isn't just Israel Gaza Palestine there's a lot more to to this with Syria Iraq and we're going to hear from some representatives later on uh, on the UN Security Council floor about Iraq and what's going on as well as we're going to hear things about Myanmar and um, the permanent representative from the UK as she makes a statement at a media stakeout but is the in in a particular email that I received 
um, that is President Biden because he is not 100% on board with Israel, is he being anti-Semitic? And that's a huge question to, to be answered. And that is what was being stated in the, the email that I received. Is he being anti-Semitic? And is anyone who says that, wait a second, Israel, can you take a step back and take a breath and let's figure this out in a peaceful way? Are they being anti-Semitic because they're asking Israel to find a more peaceful way of handling us. At the same time, we're asking the people of the Hamas to do the same. Let's find a peaceful way to settle, a peaceful way to build a dual state that allows Palestine and Palestinians to live peacefully and allows Israel and the Israelis to live peaceful lives. After all, that's mainly what we want. Okay, so weather happenings. Oh boy. And this is the, when I say oh boy, I mean big snow. Big snow for um, Nova Scotia and um, Prince Edward Isle where it is um, becoming almost useless to run a plow until the snow has stopped. They're running plows to get emergency services to where they need to go. Outside of that, they are holding off on trying to do mass clearings of the roads because the snow is coming down so fast that they can't really keep up. We're going to hear more about that from uh, Parliament about how they are going to handle the situation because Nova Scotia is in a state of emergency. And moving forward to that, we also have a interview that was done on CPAC um, with. Danielle Smith, the Premier of Alberta, and she's talking about transgender health care services. And yes, she's being criticized very heavily about her decisions, but if you listen to what she has to say about how they came to the conclusions that they did, maybe we need to listen a little closer. Maybe there, she might have something. As long as Alberta isn't um, limiting those those choices and putting the age brackets up so that they are trying to discourage transgender people from existing, period, then there may not be anything too wrong with the age limitations that they're putting to certain types of transgender um, medical help and health care. Um, with that being said, we have had a expert or two on um, depictions media to speak about gender dysphoria and how it, it can affect um, teenagers and it is a real thing and it should be of course addressed so um, at this point why don't we move forward and we're going to hear what's happening in Nova Scotia and we will hear um, A couple other things that are going on here in Canada and then we will move on to the UN floor and listen to what has happened there with Iraq and Myanmar and 
other issues that are happening around the world. Hi hey everyone, just want to make a brief statement of the significant snowfall that's taking place uh, in Nova Scotia, something that we've been monitoring very closely, uh, especially with my uh, uh, fellow members of parliament, some who actually couldn't make it uh, in today. Also spoke with the um, uh, from the mayor of uh, Cape Breton, and I spoke with Minister Lohr. So we monitored the situation very closely yesterday, and uh, late yesterday, late last night, I think around uh, uh, midnight Atlantic time, we got the official request for assistance, which I have approved. Um, and what we wanted to do was making sure that we can provide assistance very quickly. Um, so the snow removal equipment is required, uh, also for uh, helicopter support if we needed to move supplies. Uh, so Parks Canada does have uh, a snow heavy snow. A snow removal equipment that we have um, uh, authorized. Um, also, the Coast Guard will be playing an important role when it comes to the helicopters, um, but also the humanitarian workforce. Um, our SARVAC, uh, Team Rubicon, and the Red Cross will also be, uh, be playing a very important role. The details are being worked out um, at this moment, and I also, also told Minister Lohr that if the situation changes, we are ready to provide any additional support as, as needed. When can they get there? When can those It's already, uh, in fact, actually, some things are already put into place. Uh, the search and rescue folks have already been working uh, since uh, yesterday. Um, the Parks Canada uh, equipment that it all is actually uh, I was told not too far away already and also in Cape Breton they do actually have a the Coast Guard capability very close by as well so this is happening literally as we um, a, a, as we speak okay I, I, the Nova Scotia has requested help from the federal government including uh, military intervention a number of times and in, in what are you, I understand from sources that the military is not particularly interested in dealing with these domestic situations anymore. So no, what are you doing? That's right, can be further from the truth. What we want to do is making sure that we have the right resource in the right place at the right time. And in this case here, um, what we want to do is making sure that the Canadian Armed Forces are always looked at uh, for, for responding, but sometimes they are not the best resource. Uh, in this case here, the distance where the Canadian Armed Forces could respond is, is, is still quite uh, far away. The humanitarian workforce, workforce program that Team Rubicon, Red Cross, Sarvac is a part of, they're locally based. So some people that can respond very quickly. So this provides immediate uh, support. If the Canadian Armed Forces, for whatever reason is required, they can respond. And when it comes to wildfires and uh, other things, um, let's not forget the Canadian Armed Forces provides type three uh, firefighter support. Uh, what mostly in, in, a, in a wildfire situation, you need level one and level two. So what we're trying to do is making sure that we have the right resource there. And the Canadian Armed Forces, as you know, have been asked to do a lot uh, in the last 10 years, and especially probably in the last three years. They will always be ready to support, but at the same time, we want to make sure we have the right resources to support. Can you okay. clarify, do you think the provinces should be able to handle things like this on their own, or do you think it makes sense in a case like this that the federal government does need to step in? I think in an unprecedented situation like this where I've been told that this uh, snowfall hasn't taken place for some time, um, this is what the federal government is there for. Um, but what we do need to do, uh, province by province and territory, is learn what type of impact that climate change is having and what are the adjustments that we need to make. We do have a uh, federal, provincial and territorial meeting that's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks where we, where we will be discussing things um, like this, what type of resources are needed at the provincial level, but we actually want to go one, one level even lower. What resources are needed at the local level for response and also the adjustments that we need to make at the federal level as well. Okay, thank you. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, what's your message to people who are snowed under right now? So look, my riding of King's Hands, we had uh, probably somewhere between 45 to 50 centimeters of snow, which is a significant amount, but it's not nearly the extent that uh, was faced in Cape Breton. Uh, I was just talking to Mike Calway, who's the member for Cape Breton, Canso. Over 100 centimeters was recorded at the Sydney airport. Um, I think we've all seen the pictures, uh, really challenging times right now. The biggest concern, I think, uh, not only the mayor has and provincial and federal officials uh, is some communities are actually cut off particularly rural and remote communities within Cape Breton Island because plows have not actually been able to get to them uh, there's about 3,000 people who do not have electricity um, and just even seeing some of the images and talking again to local officials uh, there's a concern that particularly vulnerable seniors or people who uh, may not be able to have anyone else help them can't get out of their home and so that local state of emergency has been called uh, you heard the minister uh, say that he has accepted um, 
the uh, request from the province. I think there's an inventory going on right now about what the Government of Canada might have on the ground to help support uh, Cape Breton and Nova Scotia generally. But uh, yeah, we're, our thoughts are with uh, individuals who are going through difficult times, but Nova Scotians are tough people and uh, I know we'll rally together to, to help one another. Feels like Nova Scotia's had a rough go of it in the last uh, couple of years. Um, just what message would you have for people who are thinking, oh my God, another disaster? Yeah, look, uh, I, there's no easy words. Uh, it has been difficult. Uh, we've had Hurricane Dion, uh, Dorian, we've had Hurricane Fiona. Um, we went through tragic floods in my own community actually this past July, and then of course the worst forest fires in the province's history. So uh, this has been difficult. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, at this time, I don't think there's any loss of life. Uh, it is a, a challenge and we have to work quickly to make sure that people are protected. Um, but uh, hopefully we're able to move forward. But it is going to take a number of days to clean up and we have to work in concert together. Thank you. Tell us specifically about the allegations that you didn't consult on the uh, clean, clean drinking water bill. Well, uh, look, we have uh, been consulting with First Nations um, probably since about 2015 in one way or another on what uh, new legislation would look like in, um, in terms of uh, uh, robustness to protect First Nations' right to clean drinking water. Certainly, we've worked closely with the AFN uh, to host some of those consultations, but uh, we've also worked uh, bilaterally with First Nations and in small groups with First Nations across the city. And just last month, I went out myself to Treaty 6, 7, and 8 to hear specifically from them uh, thoughts that they had uh, about the proposed draft legislation. I will also say all First Nations received uh, the early draft of the proposed legislation and then the updated draft as we incorporated more commentary back. Um, so do you foresee any additional changes to the legislation following those consultations? I've been really open that I'm looking forward to a robust study of this legislation through the parliamentary process and in committee. I have every confidence that the committee will call forward First Nations leaders who may want to share their perspective on various elements of the bill, and I'm very open to hearing about those amendments. But I will also say that uh, I have committed to the uh, collaborators, uh, the First Nations partners that have worked so closely on this bill that the government won't be the ultimate arbitrator of amendments either rejected or accepted and that will work together to continue this co uh, this co-development work together. And just finally, the, the King has cancer, uh, is being treated for cancer. What, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, that's very sad to hear and I think cancer is a terrible disease. It's uh, very hard in some cases to treat and it puts a lot of stress on the family so I'm wishing him all the best in his recovery. Thank you very much. Sur la réforme électorale, on a entendu euh, ce matin dans, durant le débat euh, sur la motion euh, des néo-démocrates, certains de vos collègues libéraux euh, euh, plutôt des commentaires en faveur, d'autres qui semblent plutôt opposés. Euh, vous pensez-vous de votre côté que Le moment est venu d'avoir cette assemblée constituante euh, sur une réforme électorale comme propose la motion. Mais je n'ai pas regardé attentivement la motion. Pour être très honnête avec vous, j'ai pas eu la chance, euh, euh, le loisir de le faire dernièrement. Je devrais regarder ça attentivement. Mais je pense que mes collègues l'ont probablement fait avant moi, donc euh, je, les, je les félicite. Mais moi, je suis pas encore rendu là. Sur ce genre de motion, euh, bon, c'est non contraignant. Est-ce que vous pensez qu'un vote libre de, 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 de tous les collègues libéraux, euh, ce serait quelque chose. À mon avis, euh, ben, ce sera au whip de l'indiquer clairement, mais ce n'est pas ce que je peux croire. Là, les, les libéraux, comme les autres députés, ont le droit de dire ce qu'ils pensent. And, Minister, I just wanted to ask you, um, the royal family today put out a statement about the king. It turns out that he was diagnosed with cancer. Has the government initiated any plans to talk with some counterparts to, uh, you know, discuss the status and what this might mean for Canada? Well, that's a great and fair question, to be honest. I don't know where the conversations are uh, with respect to that particular matter. You wish him the best? Yes, certainly. Yes. <laughs> to any, obviously, to anyone else, we would be facing some cha such, such challenging situations. Yeah. Est-ce que si, euh, ça dépend de son état de santé, j'imagine, mais est-ce que ça peut euh, avoir, s'il doit être remplacé, s'il y a des, temporairement, est-ce qu'il peut avoir une certaine incidence euh, au Canada? Ben, je pense que les institutions sont, sont très solides, qu'il existe des mécanismes pour euh, traiter de cet enjeu. Euh, la Constitution canadienne a été bien conçue. Je 
c'est sûr qu'il va y avoir des, des façons là, de, de permettre euh, au roi de, de, de prendre le repos dont il aura probablement besoin, puis au gouvernement canadien de pouvoir fonctionner. Merci. Premier Daniel Smith, speaking with um, journalists at CPAC about Alberta's decision to limit transgender health care to the age of 16, that no one um, younger than the age of 16 can receive certain types of medical treatments re involving uh, things like hormone therapies or other things that um, can alter their puberty during uh, as a transgender person. important to introduce these trans policies. You know, why not leave it to schools? Why not leave it to, to health care professionals, even sports bodies? Why insert the government into the, to a matter that essentially is very personal? Well, I can tell you, I, I had a, an early warning sign a few months ago when I met with Lo Lois Cardinal, who is a, a transgender woman who is, she was actually seeking medical assistance and dying in Alberta because she had surgery, she thinks prematurely, felt forced into it, and then didn't get very good aftercare. And it got me thinking, if she started that, that process of transition at 19 and has those kinds of regrets, we want to make sure that, there are, that these decisions are being made at an age-appropriate level where kids are able to deal with the consequences, long-term consequences of their choices, and we think that that happens at a, a bit of an older age. So we wanted to set some guideposts in place, and that's the reason why we, we came through with the policies. Yeah, well, except that, you know, we, conservatives often talk about individual choice. Uh, you yourself have warned against government overreach. Is this not a form of government overreach? If there is one particular case, for example, where someone is expressing regret, again, why not just turn to healthcare professionals, let their professional bodies create different policies as opposed to inserting the government? Well, because there isn't any one viewpoint on this around the world. In fact, we're seeing in, in the UK with the closure of the Tavistock Clinic, we're seeing in, uh, in the Netherlands where the protocol began that they're also taking a bit more of a cautious approach. Same with so, uh, several other European countries. And so we, we think it's important if, if people are concerned that, that kids are making life-altering decisions, Irre irreversible decisions too young. We want to make sure we're doing the proper diligence, giving them the proper support, and making sure that they're making those decisions in, a, in an appropriate age. So those are the, the reasons why we're doing it. But to my understanding, the only thing that really is irreversible is, is gender reassignment surgery, uh, bottom surgery, for example. Everything else can be dealt with medically afterwards if, there, if there's a change of course, is there not? I think at Tavistock they discovered that 100% of the kids who begin with puberty blockers go on to do cross-sex hormones. So it is the beginning of the process. And we want to make sure that when kids are making that decision, that they're making it at an age where they know the consequences and they know the pathway that they're on. And so the, the feedback that we've gotten as well is that parents want to be involved in what's going on in their kids' lives. Because these decisions, once they're made, happen very quickly. And they're going to need all the support of their, the loving adults in their lives around them. So we want to make sure that there isn't any division between the, the, the child and the, uh, the, the adults who are their caregivers. But if an adult, if parents decided, for example, that their child, uh, in conversation, uh, should be pursuing a hormone blocker or some type of gender-affirming therapy, uh, under these proposals, if you're under the age of 16, that's not available to you. Is it really the government's place to say it shouldn't be available to you if you have individual consent and parental consent? Well, it's not a parent's decision on those kinds of issues. It's not a doctor's decision on those kinds of issues. It's not, it's not a politician's decision. It's the person's decision. And so we have to make a judgment about whether or not that child is mature enough to understand the long-term consequences of uh, affecting their reproductive health, their ability to have children. And so um, most uh, practitioners agree that that age of, of maturity comes somewhere around age 16. And that's part of the reason why we put the, the policies in place. Uh, you've heard this, uh, trans activists, they're upset by what was introduced last week. Uh, they make the argument that essentially it is abusive to bring about policies that, that limit gender affirming therapies. Uh, they say that uh, someone who has to go through, through puberty uh, not affirming their gender is excruciatingly painful. That leads to self-doubt, questions, oftentimes suicidal thoughts. Are you concerned that you, you might be contributing to the, to the challenge of suicide with trans kids with this? I, I can tell you that there is not a single viewpoint in the LGBT plus community 
that uh, we've, we've had many people who've expressed concern as kids are exploring their identity, that they are, are not locked into a position prematurely. If they're going to make a decision that's going to alter their, their sex and affect their reproductive health, it, it, the advice that we've been given is those are decisions that are adult decisions. And so we're going to make sure that we're preserving those choices for kids. Uh, Randy Boissonneau, who of course hails from Alberta, okay. Alberta uh, he says with this policy you are bringing in an American style cultural war to Canada. We've also spoken to others who, who say this is purposely a wedge issue by which you are gaining support by dividing Albertans. What do you say to that? Look, we've been, we've been watching the discussion. We've been very thoughtful as we've watched the discussion play out in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, as well as internationally and around the world. And we, we think it's important, especially with the case that I mentioned at the top, that if there are individuals who feel like they have uh, made the decision prematurely or were pressured, we, we want to make sure that there's a considered approach to that process, that uh, young people need to know that when they make their decisions that they're, that it has lifelong consequences. And the question is at what age should a child be able to make those kinds of life altering decisions? And we think that age is 16. Uh, we saw people come out this weekend opposing to what was introduced last week. Is there any room for amendment for you? Is there any room for changing what you've introduced? Look, we're, we're going to have discussions. We wanted to put it on the table and I'll continue to, to have um, discussions, feedback with, with parents, with, uh, with teachers, with medical professionals, understanding that uh, there isn't uh, one right answer on this. There, there isn't one viewpoint. There's multiple viewpoints. And so we've got to balance that and make sure that everything that we do is done through the lens of what's best for the child and making sure that the children preserve all of their choices I think should be what is uh, what is guiding our decisions a joint stakeout um, on the uh, UN floor um, as the permanent representative of the United Kingdom takes the microphone and speaks about what is happening in Miramar and what the expectations from the Miramar militants, the demands of releases of people, and in uh, how they um, overturned and it um, imprisoned uh, who could be innocent people. So let's listen to what was said in the stakeout as uh, also um, there's a defense mechan a defense asked about other moral judgments because of some of the things that happened with UNRWA and the UN workers um, with things that happened in Palestine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, the Security Council will convene a private meeting to discuss the situation in Myanmar. We will hear from Special Envoy Alunkeo Kitakun on Laos' plans as Chair of ASEAN to address the Myanmar crisis, and from Assistant Secretary General Kiari for an update on the UN's efforts in this regard. I'm making the following statement on behalf of Ecuador, France, Japan, Malta, the Republic of Korea, Slovenia, Switzerland, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The 1st of February marked three years since the Myanmar military overturned the democratically elected government. The situation in the country remains dire. We strongly condemn the ongoing violence harming civilians, including the military's continued use of indiscriminate airstrikes. We echo the call of ASEAN in urging the Myanmar armed forces in particular to cease its attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure. Three years in, more than 18 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance and 2.6 million have been and remain displaced from their homes. We reiterate the Council's repeated call for full, rapid, safe, and unhindered, unimpeded humanitarian access to all people in need, including women, children, and members of ethnic and other minority populations. 
We remain deeply concerned about the situation in Rakhine State, which has further deteriorated following the breakdown of the ceasefire within the state. Rohingya, who have faced systematic discrimination for decades, continue to be disproportionately affected by the conflict. We're increasingly concerned by the restrictions on freedom of movement, as well as the denial of access of medicine and medical care. We underscore the need to create conditions conducive to voluntary, safe, dignified and sustainable return of Rohingya refugees and internally displaced persons. As set out in UN Security Council Resolution 2669, we demand an immediate end to all forms of violence and we urge restraint and de-escalation of tensions. We continue to urge the Myanmar military to immediately release all arbitrarily detained prisoners, including President Win Mint and State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi. We urge all parties to respect human rights, fundamental freedoms, the rule of law, and the democratic will and interests of the people of Myanmar. We remain deeply concerned at the continued lack of progress on these issues and once again call for the full implementation of Resolution 2669. We reiterate our strong support for ASEAN and the efforts of the ASEAN Chair and acknowledge ASEAN's central role in pursuit of a peaceful, comprehensive and durable solution to the ongoing crisis. We call on the Myanmar military to fulfill its commitments to effectively and fully implement the ASEAN Five Point Consensus. We look forward to the timely appointment of a resident coordinator and the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on Myanmar to enable close coordination between ASEAN and the UN. We continue to stand in solidarity with the people of Myanmar and their desire for a peaceful, inclusive and democratic future. Thank you. Um, uh, Yvonne Moriarty, News. Can I ask, do you, do you think that Britain's stance on the Israel-Gaza war undermines your moral authority when it comes to conflicts like Myanmar? So we're intensely engaged in uh, the Israel-Gaza discussions. My Foreign Secretary, as well as Secretary Blinken, are on the road as we speak. Right now, we're going to discuss Myanmar. Thank you. And next segment from the UN Security Council uh, floor, as a representative from Iraq talks about how the attacks should come to an end, that there should be a cease to all attacks um, in, uh, in Iraq, from Iran, and from other neighboring countries as they push forward with rebuilding their own country. I now give the floor to Ms. Janine Hennis Plasher. Thank you, Madam President, distinguished members of the Security Council. With the conflict raging in Gaza, as well as armed action elsewhere, the Middle East is at a critical juncture, and the same is true for Iraq. Now, to be clear, Iraq's government's efforts are focused on avoiding a domestic and regional spillover. Still, continued attacks have become a harsh reality. And these attacks originate from within and outside of the country's borders. Attacks which, if they were to continue, stand to undo Iraq's hard-won stability, as well as other achievements made in the past 18 months. Now, as we all know, history can have a long tail, one which can impact the presence. And this is serially true for the Middle East. To fully grasp the current regional and domestic dynamics, therefore, we would need to traverse decades, an exercise this briefing does not allow for. That said, it is within this context that various Iraqi armed groups, groups acting outside state control that is, 
reference as a justification for their operations, a doctrine which transcends politics and state borders. Other motivations expressed pertain specifically to Iraq, such as calls for Iraqi skies to be, and I quote, free, and for an end to the international military presence in the country. However, for Iraq to further continue on its path of stability and progress, an enabling environment will prove essential. And such an environment requires restraint from all sides. Yes, indeed, from Iraq's armed actors. And as might be expected, restraint from Iraq's neighbors and other countries is just as crucial. I have said it numerous times in the past and will say it again. Messaging by strikes only serves to heighten tensions, to kill or injure people, and to destroy property. A case in point was the attack on 28 January, which killed and injured US service members. This was seen again with the retaliatory strikes on 2 February, which also resulted in casualties. But rather than resorting to the use of force, all efforts should center on safeguarding Iraq from being drawn in any way into a wider conflict. And it is precisely within this context that many expressed shock over Iran's missile attack on Erbil a few weeks ago, which killed civilians, including a little girl. Based on accusations, the Iraqi government has strongly refuted these actions were sorely at odds with the great efforts made on the Iraq-Iran security agreement, which I highlighted in my October briefing. Meanwhile, Turkish military operations in the north also continue. Just because these attacks have become the new normal does not mean that they do not seriously compound the risk of new arenas of violence being opened. Now, when talking about the incendiary potential of retaliatory strikes, we would like to welcome the recent launch of dialogue through the United States-Iraq Higher Military Commission. This dialogue channel opened at a critical moment, and the setting of joint objectives could only be a positive development amid rising tensions. Having said all this today, I am compelled to reiterate our appeal to all sides to exercise maximum restraint. With Iraq cloaked in an already complex tapestry of challenges, it is of the greatest importance that all attacks cease. And while we are, of course, aware that many authorities and actors seek to limit further escalation, it is clear that the situation remains volatile. Iraq, indeed, the wider region, remain on a knife edge, with the tiniest miscalculation threatening a major conflagration. Now, on a more optimistic note, Madam President, on 18 December 2023, Iraq held local elections for the first time in 10 years, and in the case of Kirkuk, for the first time since 2005. This electoral process took place in a broadly, broadly peaceful and technically sound manner. It marked another milestone in the government's efforts to break from past cycles of dysfunction. And we truly hope that the re-establishment of local representative bodies, which have been inactive since 2019, will signify another major step forward. Now, a challenge for future elections will be to rally a higher voter turnout and, importantly, to encourage Iraq's eligible voters to register. While turnout among registered voters for the 2023 Governor Council elections was on par with Iraq's national parliamentary elections two years prior, around 60% of registered voters did not cast their ballots. <clears throat> and this combined with the fact that millions of Iraqis did not even register to begin with spotlights the magnitude of the challenge that lies ahead. Building public trust and thus encouraging the majority of Iraq's eligible voters to participate in the democratic process will entail continuous and hard work. Another positive development to report on is that Iraq's government continues to strengthen the country's finance and banking sectors. Mergers and structural reforms of key insurance and banking entities demonstrate yet again the government's commitment to nurturing a transparent, compliant financial sector in Iraq. Steps taken to strengthen public financial management, including by establishing a single treasury account, have also been welcomed by the IMF and others. Now, alongside new, electro new electronic platforms for foreign currency sales, which I mentioned in my last briefing, these initiatives are set to be instrumental in enhancing the transparency and manageability of Iraq's public finances. Meanwhile, um, ambitious construction projects continue apace. These have included major, major housing complexes, which will, I hope, be open to all Iraqis. Similarly, a government commitment to build a thousand new schools by the end of 2024, if realized, would be a real opportunity accelerator. 
and national incentives for development projects like special loans and exemptions also indicate the government's determination to see these and other visions take concrete shape. Next month, Iraq will become the first country in the region to join the International Labour Organization's Convention on the Elimination of Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. Coupled with the new national security law, this sets a regional precedent for employee protection, which should benefit Iraqi workers, especially women. And such standard setting and benefit expansion must also be seen as part of efforts to strengthen Iraq's private sector. Now these and other reforms, as I have said before, are critical to unlocking a brighter future for all Iraqis, a future in which the country can move from fighting fires to crafting sustainable solutions, a future in which young people can use their skills and capacities to better their lives and communities rather than taking to the streets out of desperation or worse, taking up arms. Madam President, um, let me hone in on a few other issues. Firstly, climate change. Iraq's participation in the COP28 summit in December produced some promising commitments. These included a complete phase out of gas flaring by 2028 and the establishment of a new green sustainable bank to diversify the Iraqi economy away from fossil fuels. A slew of projects to incentivize water conservation and sustainability across various sectors as well as promised investments in clean energy exploration also augur well for the future. Now, when it comes to climate change, cries from global platforms have increasingly formed a crescendo of doom. And in Iraq, it is not hard to see why. Water scarcity, desertification, forced migration, conflict over natural resources, extreme weather events. It all combines to paint a rather bleak picture in which existing fault lines um, come under increasing pressure. But instead of giving in to a um, sense of despair, and as emphasized by Iraq's Prime Minister, focus must now shift to mitigation and adaptation. For instance, through the implementation of inclusive, peace-positive environmental management programs, the modernization of irrigation infrastructure, and immediate steps to reduce oil reliance. That said, without moving from promises to actions, opportunities may slip away and fast. Secondly, I wish to again highlight existing feelings of exclusion and marginalization, which, as we all know, often lead to recurring cycles of conflict. Managing diversity is never easy, but if done well, represents a major win in preventing instability, mistrust and violence, and in promoting respect for human rights. Key to this is the rule of law, of course. If justice, if justice systems are seen to be treating people in discriminatory ways, tensions among communities can quickly boil over. Madam President, as you know, in mid-November, a ruling of the Federal Supreme Court suddenly ended the term of Iraq's parliamentary speaker. Today, nearly three months later, political bickering continues to prevent consensus on his replacement. Needless to say, we can only hope that an agreement will emerge sooner rather than later. On the Kurdistan region, I regret to report that the region's parliamentary elections have again been held up. Initially scheduled for October 22, they were postponed to November 23, then further delayed to February of this year, and we are now awaiting a new date. Let me be clear, these continued postponements do not help already low trust levels, nor do they contribute to Iraq's stability. And wrangling between Baghdad and Erbil on financial and budgetary issues goes on, while acknowledging that there are various difficult and technical issues at play, this does not change the fact that in the absence of a sustainable agreement, it is the everyday people who suffer. The recent decision of the federal government to approve the financing of the region for the month of January, in accordance with the federal budget for the year 2024, is of course to be welcomed, but we can only reiterate that a more permanent solution is desperately needed. In simple terms, if stability is to be preserved, the Kurdistan region must receive funding to pay its civil servants their monthly salaries. Meanwhile, UN Iraq continues to evolve. The mission's independent strategic review is ongoing and the country team has shifted, as you know, from a humanitarian to a development focus. And of course, a new UN cooperation framework is on its way, which will support national priorities and accelerate the achievements of the SDGs. We wish to mention that Iraq's Council of Ministers has set 30 July 2024 as the date for the closure of all displacement camps throughout the country, including the Kurdistan region. 
This decision is welcome as it defines concrete steps, establishes mechanism, and dedicates government funding to the goal of ending displacement. Having said this, UN Iraq underscores that this decision should be complemented by solutions for displaced people outside camps. Equally important is ensuring all returns and relocations are informed, safe, voluntary, dignified and inclusive and pursued in cooperation and coordination with the Kurdistan regional government. Madam President, turning to the issue of missing Kuwaiti and third country nationals and missing Kuwaiti property, including the National Archives. The government of Iraq remains undoubtedly committed to this file. But with 308 missing persons still unaccounted for, swifter progress is needed. And this must involve the dismantling of bureaucratic hurdles and immediate follow-up immediate follow on outstanding issues. There is also a clear need to redouble efforts to locate and return missing Kuwaiti property, including the National Archives. What we are essentially saying is that it is in everybody's interest to show a sense of urgency so as to bring this important file to a close. Madam President, what is needed now? As I have said many times, no government can go it alone. Hence, we can only hope that each and every one of Iraq's politicians will continue working to put the country on the clearest path to success in the best interests of all Iraqis, whatever their affiliation, background or ethnicity. And the same goes for any other actor in or outside Iraq. They are expected to support this objective rather than to thwart it. One thing is for sure, the need for sustainable progress, for real reform, for better living standards will not decline. Iraq's population grows every year, driving even more demand for jobs, housing, water and other essential services. And while many of the plans on the government's books hold the key to meeting these needs, they will become more and more difficult to realize with each year that passes, and so the time to act is now. In closing, Madam President, let me once again stress the importance of an enabling environment and thus the urgent need to cease attacks, be they originating from within or outside of Iraq's borders. And as stated many times in past years, this must include reining in armed actors operating outside state control. It is quite simple. The enormous risks and potential devastating consequences of continued escalation cannot be overstated. And this is, again, true for Iraq, the region and beyond. Last but not least, Madam President, in December 2018, I arrived in Baghdad, now five years ago, uh, later. It is almost time for me to say goodbye. I expect to depart from this position at the end of May. And this is not easy, I have to say. Through the many highs and lows, Iraq simply has become part of me. That said, today's briefing could very well be my last address to the Security Council on Iraq. And while it's tempting to look back and reflect, I am conscious of time constraints, of course, but please allow me to use this opportunity to thank both the Council and Iraq's authorities for their support and to express my vast appreciation for each and every one of my UN Iraq colleagues. Most importantly, I wish to thank the people of Iraq for their boundless hospitality, their generosity and their kindness. And wherever I go, they will always have a special place in my heart. And I can only hope that one day, inshallah, people from around the world will get to know the real Iraq, a country of immense beauty, a country of rich diversity and culture, where there are so many opportunities to grasp. Now let me end by publicly paying tribute to all Iraqi men and women for their sacrifices, their strength, and the depth of their commitment to building a prosperous, democratic, and peaceful Iraq. Aish al Iraq, long live Iraq. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We need to impress upon uh, government officials and global government officials uh, that we need to find peaceful and uh, less harmful ways than going to war and activating military actions to our conflicts. We should sit at tables, talk, figure things out, plan things so that we all have a happy space to live in. 
Please find that subscribe button wherever it may be on your screen. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.